Fuck the hype. You're listening to Damn Well Better, the Rebel's Guide to Health. This is the podcast where we take a deeper dive into the fitness industry and bring you the real conversations that affect your health and well-being. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to another episode of Damn Well Better with your girl, the Iron Beaver. Today I got to sync time zones with Miss Avery Clements, writer for the Jiu-Jitsu Times. Avery's also a brown belt and a personal trainer out of Adelaide, Australia. Now Avery's been writing for the Jiu-Jitsu Times for many years, and as I can always remember, she's been beating the drum for women and marginalized groups in the sport. And, you know, it's always had mixed reception. But now, people can't really ignore it because the controversy out of fight sports in Florida has blown the lid off the dark side of jujitsu culture. Fight sports has had multiple professors accused of sexual abuse and rape and gym owners accused of covering the whole thing up. And this isn't just a local story from Florida or told in jiu-jitsu communities. This has actually made it all the way to the New York Times. And Avery's been covering it from day one. And what's cool about the conversation we have is we we talk a lot about jiu-jitsu culture and the ways it can actually foster this kind of environment and promote secrecy and keeping things quiet, shoving things under the rug, and what seem like a bunch of unrelated kind of cultural pressures sort of swirl together and they make the whole kind of toxic cloud that makes shit like this possible. This isn't going to be a real feel-good podcast about jujitsu, but that's because we actually love jujitsu and we would like to see the culture change but I'm not going to monologue it. I'm just going to drop you right into it. Let's start at the beginning. How long have you been training? And, you know, what's your jujitsu story? Yeah, so I've been training a bit over nine years now. Um, So I started, I was actually living in Costa Rica in 2012, and I was coming back from visiting a friend, and I was in a taxi. Taxi driver got a bit creepy handsy with me and I got out I was crying like it was a whole mess like nothing like happened but it was terrifying you know um and I was like you know what I never ever want to deal with that again like I felt so helpless and scared and so there was a a martial arts gym just down the road from me at the time and they had Krav Maga so I wanted to do Krav Maga because I was like oh that's like self-defense self-defense but it didn't align with my work schedule So I uh, started doing kickboxing and then the person that I was dating at the time had just started jujitsu. I had no idea what jujitsu was. I was like, ah, jujitsu, like karate. I was one of those people. Um, But I started it and I, uh, I tried it. I really, really liked it. Um, I don't think there was ever a moment that I like fell in love with it, you know, like where some people go in and they're like, that was the moment I knew it was just like, oh, this is pretty fun. And I just kept coming back, you know, um, And so I left Costa Rica in 2017, went back to where I'm from, which is Pennsylvania. I went from white to purple belt in Costa Rica. And then uh, I moved to Australia. I believe it was, not yeah, it must have been um, October 2018. Got my brown belt here. And yeah, started writing for the Jiu-Jitsu Times when I was just a blue belt. So uh, (laughs) obviously I've learned a lot since then. When did you start writing for the Jiu-Jitsu Times? Around what year? Um... I want to say it was around 2016. I was at a tournament in Pennsylvania. I met a guy there, Emil Fisher, who also writes for the Jiu-Jitsu Times. And uh, we just got to talking and he was like, oh, you know, if you're a writer, because I was writing just for a different website at the time. He's like, I write for this Jiu-Jitsu website called the Jiu-Jitsu Times. We're always looking for writers. So if you want, like, I can hook you up. So yeah, I did. We're both still writing for the JJT today. So been a rewarding friendship you know in many ways he's a good dude what kind of articles did you write when you started I focused a lot on mental health I was a blue belt at the time like I said so I didn't know a whole lot of like actual jiu-jitsu I wasn't like super involved with the community at the time but all I knew was I'd been struggling with depression for a few years at that point and jiu-jitsu had 
really helped me not only in the sense of like with the actual symptoms of depression, but kind of as a, um, I guess, like as a symbol for what I could do, even with this mental health condition. So, um, and just my journey with jujitsu, you know, what it meant to me to be out of training for two months and hardly able to get out of bed and um, coming back and, you know, my teammates were still there for me and I didn't feel judged. So I mostly wrote about the the mental health benefits of jujitsu and like how good it was for me to know that I was being squished, like someone was on top of me inside control. And I could then apply that to real life and say, okay, I'm in this really tough and uncomfortable situation and I'm stuck here for a while, but I can collect myself and get out of that. Um, so that's actually how I started. When did some of these articles go from being about mental health and, you know, sort of like the physical or mental benefits of jujitsu to social justice pieces and eventually outing rapists? Yeah. So, um, I I was talking, um, with a friend a while ago and he asked me, um, kind of a similar question of like, when did the, the rose colored glasses come off? You know, like, um, Cause I think when you're a white or a blue belt, um, you kind of see jujitsu as like, this is amazing. Like it's where everybody comes together. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the shaka, the, you know, peace and love. And um, ar- around like, I think it was probably late blue belt, early purple belt stages. I started to really realize that my experience as a woman in jujitsu was very different from that of my male teammates. You know, like I was, I was very used to getting, um, you know, sexually harassed or, you know, kind of having to like send people off who were really like aggressive with me. Like I've been yelled at on the street because I said no to a drink with a guy, you know what I mean? Like, so I was so used to those experiences that when they happened in jujitsu, it was just like, oh, it's part of the game. You know what I mean? Like it was just like a, a microcosm of what was going on outside. But then I started to really pay attention to it and it started to affect me. And I was like, what the heck? Like I got into this for self-defense purposes. And, you know, I've been told that this is, you know, everybody sticks up for each other, but that's not happening for me. You know, when I bring these things up, people are dismissing them. Like it was just happening so much. So I'm like, surely I can't be the only one. And then um, I don't know if there was like a specific moment where like I wrote something that just like kicked off this trajectory of my writing, but I started to write something about it and I got a lot of like really negative pushback on it. And I was like, that's very strange. You know, like I was kind of expecting that this would just be common sense. Like, yes, it is bad if you treat people like this. And instead I got pushback and being told like, oh, you're, you're um, overreacting. You know, oh, such a feminazi. I did not understand it. And um, as I started to interview more of the big name athletes in the sport and also talk to um, other women in the sport, I started realizing that this was a bigger problem. So I think initially it was probably more like, you know, uh, like uh, you could call it like white feminism, you know, like I did not see the other issues that were affecting, you know, um, trans people that were affecting people of color, black people, native people that were in the sport. But then through my the articles that I did about sexual assault and things like that, other people started coming to me and I started realizing like, oh man, this is like really an intersectional problem as well. So that's when it got into other topics as well. Yeah. Well, and I think 2020 really blew the lid off the last vestiges of what you call white feminism. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still some women out there that are (laughs) totally still clinging to that, that yoga tea shit. Yeah. <laughs> but if you were paying attention in 2020, like you're like, oh, fuck, you know what I mean? <laughs> and whether you knew it was going on, but just didn't, ah, it doesn't really apply to my life. I can't worry about everything. You know, everyone's got to worry about themselves, you know, whatever you mm-hmm. say to yourself. I really think if, if you lived through 2020 and you still think that yeah, race and intersectionality and um, gay and trans issues like aren't a big deal. Like, I, I don't even know if we could have a conversation. Like, right? Yeah. I I find that anytime you start going to the bottom of these issues, you realize it's all sort of rooted in the same space. Yes. 
And the root is some very angry folks <laughs> <laughs> who are in control and, and they don't like to feel like they're not in control. And um, that's, that's really as basic as it gets, I think. Yeah. Um, and something I think about a lot, um, and this point has been brought up to me well, and it, it crosses my mind every time there is bad news in, in the jiu-jitsu community and beyond. But like, you know, if white women are being treated like this, then you know it's got to be worse for people who aren't as privileged. You know what I mean? So, and I, I think a lot of those stories, unfortunately, for you know, people of color and, you know, people in the LGBTQ community, like, I, I feel like people are so scared to even come forward with those because they see, and like, I know this for a fact, I've been told this um, by people in those communities, but they see how, you know, white women are treated in our sport. And it's like, well, if it's this dangerous for them with all this privilege, like, what hope mm -hmm. do we have? You know what I mean? And I think that's awful. You know, I don't, for a sport that is supposed to be empowering and teach it, you know, to defend yourself in theory, you know, like, is it really serving its purpose if the people that are supposed to be protected are actually in danger and don't feel protected? And I wonder sometimes too, like, what was the purpose? I mean, mm -hmm. was the whole empower women's empowerment, is that just a marketing tool? Yeah. Um, you know, and, like, yeah. <laughs> Is that the purpose of jujitsu? I don't know, because to me, it seems like the purpose of jujitsu was for, you know, a lot of Brazilian guys to beat the shit out of a lot of other Brazilian guys. And that was the purpose. And now they came to America and they're like, oh, fuck, we got to make money. So then mm -hmm. family. Come yeah. On. Come on, ladies, <laughs> let's learn self-defense. Fight off those big bad guys. And then you realize, oh, shit, some of those big bad guys are the black belts that are training me. Yeah. And I think like, uh, this is something I wrestle with um, quite a bit, actually, like internally is like how many women would have gone either their whole lives or at least longer without having to have had to deal with something terrible. Like if they hadn't signed up to jujitsu to defend themselves, like jujitsu marketing, especially for women. Like when you look at jujitsu marketing for men, it's like, learn what the UFC guys learn, you know, yeah. like let out your inner alpha wolf like which don't even get me started on that <laughs> um, <laughs> but um you know it's very macho and sport oriented and like masculinity oriented and when you look at how it's marketed towards women it's very like there are terrible people hiding in the bushes like you need to know how to protect yourself and so it's targeting people who are either already have been assaulted or you know are worried about that you know, so these people are coming in and they're vulnerable and they're scared and they're looking at these black belts who've been, you know, just worshipped in pop culture. And you hear the word black belt as an untrained person. You're like, that's so cool. You know, like it doesn't matter what you're black belt and all you have to say is I'm a black belt. And it's like, psh, like sparkles, you know. And so, yeah, you take these vulnerable people and you put them in that situation with somebody that they're looking up to. And then that person in power, you know, violates that trust you know, it's a recipe for disaster a lot of the time. It is. And it's crazy how many stories in the last month have come out about the abuse. It just made me think of like, you know, things personally, it hasn't happened to me, not sexual mm -hmm. abuse. I've had the um, sudden BJJ family goes to BJJ. We don't know you because you are not a part of our gym anymore. <laughs> like, yeah, I've had that <laughs> happen, but like, I've never, but there were incidences that I've known about. Everybody just brushes it under the rug or says, oh, I don't think so. Or, eh, you know, like, oh, you should talk to professor or whatever. And it's yeah. like, and then professor tells somebody like, oh, just don't roll with that guy or, you know, yeah. whatever, because he's not going to step in because all, all that alpha wolf male bullshit is he yeah. can't even stand up to his own student and be like, hey, don't touch that girl's tits when you're rolling, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm kind of like, oh, wow, you guys are all a bunch of fucking pussies. Like, that's what mm -hmm. this is. That's what yeah. this is, you know? It's been really cathartic, I think, for a lot of us to just watch all these stories roll out. And, and you have been really 
brave writing about it. And I don't say that in any kind of patronizing tone, like, because I know that in jujitsu, if you step out of line, you are like fucking shunned. You are, (laughs) you're not cool. You're going to get all this blowback. You're going to get hate mail. uh, You're going to be attacked by, you know, somebody's army of minions, whatever. But as a woman who used to do jujitsu, I thank you. Like seriously, Uh fucking thank you for standing up and saying the things you do. Um, I think we all really appreciate it. (laughs) Aside from that, (laughs) when you do, of course, when you do (laughs) report these kind of things, how do you um, gather your information? How do you do your reporting? And like, how do you verify your information? There's a lot that goes into it, which um, I know, you know, for the the situation with Marcel Goncalves, we're seeing how, you know, and I've spoken with um, Mo, you know, um, Mo Yassim, who runs ADCC. I've been speaking with him a lot. Um, So we're working very closely together, but he can just put out information very quickly. Whereas when you're putting together an article, you know, like I have to be a lot more careful with Mm -hmm. what I put out, be a bit more thorough. And that's not to say one is better or worse than the other. Like it's teamwork. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm very lucky that so many people are very willing to speak to me about these things. Um, so in a case like this, we're very lucky that there is a like a good paper trail. Like there's publicly available online court documents. Um, we have to reach out to everybody who is involved. Sometimes that may be one person. Sometimes it's, you know, as many people as you can who are even loosely connected with a situation that to me is important, not only because like it's my job, but it's important to have the whole story, you know, and it's important for ethical journalism, no matter how I feel about a certain situation, you know, like (laughs) you have to be thorough, you know, and make sure that everybody involved gets the opportunity to say what they want, whether that's to defend themselves or to verify or not verify, you know, you just have to give them that chance. So it's a lot of digging through social media. Um, it's a lot of other people who have also been following things behind the scenes and said, hey, here's something that I found. You know, here's where I found it. And then you can go back and find it. So yeah, there, it's it's a lot. But yeah, it's basically asking yourself like, okay, here's a question that I have. Where can I find more information about this? Or who might be a good person to come to for information about this um, and just digging as deep as you can. And have you found, you know, are most people willing to tell you even if they're the accused or no? It depends. Like for example, with the Marcel case, Cyborg and Wagner were both more than happy to share their side of things, which I was really grateful for. Um, There were other people that we reached out to that saw the messages and didn't respond, you know, which is their choice. But yeah, I think it depends on what people want to, I don't know if the right word is portray, but if they have a message that they want to share, like we're happy to share that for them. But there are a lot of people who just are like, nope, like I don't even want to discuss this. I don't want my name attached to this. So they just kind of back out. No doubt. Because nobody really wants to be attached with uh, rape and yeah, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. It's kind of yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty ugly. What kind of blowback have you received from writing these articles? Uh, So a few years ago, when um, Marcel was first arrested, and it wasn't just about Marcel, it was about, you know, the the systemic problem in jujitsu of people um, who were sticking up for other people who were accused of sexual assault or convicted of sexual assault or abuse or, you know, a a whole litany of terrible things. And I wrote an article saying stop defending people just because they're good at sports, which to me is pretty like basic level of common decency. It's the softest thing you could possibly say to anybody. Like, hey guys, just because somebody's a black belt doesn't make them great. Like that should yeah. be like, yeah, bro, totally. Yeah. Like I thought all like that to me, like people are like, oh, you're so brave for writing. And to me, that was like very just like common sense. You know, that was pretty stand like a standard opinion. I thought a couple hours later, I got a message from the gym owner's wife where I was training saying that uh, I was not welcome back at the gym. Ah. Um, and yeah, so there were other things mentioned, but um, what kept coming up is, you know, oh, your articles are the problem. Your articles are the problem. I was like, all right, <laughs> like I can put two and two together. 
yeah, so that was probably the biggest moment of like, oh, wow, like there are people who feel so strongly about this stuff on the other side of things that like they're not willing to have me around. Um, and it was fine. Like I was kind, I don't want to say I was on my way out of there, but there had been enough red flags that I saw the message and I just kind of laughed and I went to another gym quickly and was very happy there until I moved to Australia. But uh, yeah, for the most part, it's just like the occasional angry person in my DMs or like, you know, some weirdo in a public comment section. But I, I feel like I've been blessed with a lot of people who are on my side and on the right side of things and saying like, no, like this shouldn't be happening. You know, we shouldn't be worshiping these people just because they're good at violence, you know? So yeah. <laughs> for, <laughs> <In> yeah. Fact. <laughs> Yeah, so there's been, you know, some negativity, but the positivity really outweighs it all. Well, that's really good to hear. Um, yeah. It's interesting you say that about your old gym. I don't want to dredge things up, but <laughs> did they have, I mean, was it they had their own skeletons or do you think they were just like, we don't want anybody talking about anything that could be possibly misconstrued as bad about our sport? I mean, the owner had some friends that had stuff on their records and prior to this article coming out he had been kind of buddy buddy with somebody pretty well known in the sport who had some pretty awful accusations against him and I told him when he started to kind of get buddy buddy with this person I was like hey like just so you know like this person does have some big red flags attached to him and he's like oh yeah yeah but he he's so nice he's always been nice to me I'm like I'm sure he's a very nice guy. I've met him. He's very nice. He also has this attached to him, like yeah. very credible charges filed. And, uh, oh no, he, yeah, but he's so nice. You know, he was, he was so nice. I was like, of course he's nice. <laughs> you yeah. know, like niceness is like the basic, like most fundamental level of human decency, like be a nice person. Like he's not going to be well, an asshole to everybody. And beyond <laughs> human decency, most psychopaths are very nice. Oh yeah. Like yeah, they're charming. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. They're, you know, like the people who go home and like beat the shit out of their girlfriends or whatever, they're not guys that you're thinking, Oh, that guy's a jerk. They're usually this nice guy. No guy that's gonna, you know, like rape and beat up women is going to go to some black belt dude and mouth off. That's what always surprises me too. Like, oh, he's fine. It's like, yeah, he's fine to you because you're, you know, a 250 pound, you know, brown or black belt or whatever. Of course, they're going to be yeah. fucking old cow yeah. telling to you and, you know, kiss your ass to your face. Yeah. You know what I and mean? also like, that's not their target. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, there's no, like, why wouldn't they be this pinnacle of like, yeah, niceness and human decency to somebody who they're not trying to target? In the jujitsu culture, I think that there's so much unpacking, I think, that uh, we have to do because there is this old school, you know, way. And then, like we said before, they advertise for families, for women, for children, for all this stuff. So all these families and women and children come show up. And they also advertise like, oh, we're the sport for nerds and we're the sport for, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. And like you show up and you're like, oh, I don't know if I belong here. If you don't get to that kind of a gym where you're like, oh, this is cool. Like, you know, some nerd gym where you, you feel comfortable, but if you go to an old school gym, you learn pretty quick that you don't really belong. Yeah. You know what I mean? And people get really angry at that because they want to blame you. You're the one that has a problem. And it's like, no, you advertise everybody to come in here and for this to be this big family but you're kind of running this, you know, sort of feudal boot camp. <laughs> and <laughs> man, I remember when I started, like every night was me, you know, there was two other women in the entire school. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and they were cool. like, I can't say they were mean to me or anything like that, but it's like, I was constantly, you know, just getting worked by these like 170, 200 pound white and blue belt dudes who had something to prove to professor you know, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> like almost every night of the week. And if I'd complain, everyone was like, you're just a bitchy lady. Yeah. But then I sit there 
Like I'd sit there during stretches or I'd, or I'd, you know, socialize with these people and they'd all be bitching about the same people. Like, oh, this fucking dude cranks on my arm and I told him not to crank on my arm. And oh, that, that guy's just such a fucking dick and he smells bad. Like they're the biggest hens. But then when I yeah. complained, it's like, oh, you women always complaining, yeah. you know, like you don't, yeah. you don't know how to handle the men's sports. And it's like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like they don't see it. They don't see themselves complaining all the time about the same dudes that I complain about. Yeah, you know, and it's yeah. just like, and and when that happens, like, how are they gonna see? Like, when you're like, hey, this guy got weird and sexual with me, or hurt me, or mm-hmm. I think he really hates me. They're mm-hmm. gonna be like, no, no, that's not yeah. happening. You know, yeah. Cause it's something that in their world isn't happening. Yeah. They think you if know? they don't see it, then it must not exist. Yeah, exactly. I mean, do you think there's a problem with BJJ culture or what What do you think kind of fosters this sort of strange toxicity? Oh, man, I think there's a lot that goes into it. I know people get like really triggered by this word, but like there's a lot of the, the patriarchal system in jiu-jitsu. And I know people hear that and go like, oh, I'm a Nazi, but like, what else are you going to call it? You know, that yeah. sport is run by dudes for dudes. Women are an afterthought, you know. Look into the dude. history. Look yeah. into the history. Those guys have all, they have some interesting thoughts on life. <laughs> yeah. You go look up what they thought. For yeah, sure. exactly. Yeah. So it's very much built on that you know, there's, (laughs) the more you look into it, and this is something that I've been grateful for to a lot of my friends for bringing to light for me, there's a lot of white supremacy in martial arts, not even just jujitsu, but in MMA, you know, there's a lot of that in there. There's, it's just like, for as much as we say, oh, it's designed to help the little people, the nerds, the, you know, the weaker people, you know, the, the people at the top are doing more to, to hold those systems in place, you know, than to uproot the system and put, you know, people who are not straight white cis dudes into power. It's a lot of bro culture that's led in from the outside and come into the middle because I think something else that contributes to it is like this proximity to greatness where, you know, you can't really ever hope to play basketball with LeBron James or soccer with Mia Hamm or, you know what I mean? But you can take a seminar from Gordon Ryan, Gary Tonin, like, you know, anybody who's a big, big name in jujitsu, like the very top, you, you can meet them, you know, they might respond to you on social media. And so that removes, I think, uh, like it, it, it takes away this completely, um, I don't want to use the term parasocial relationship, but it kind of takes away that barrier of like, oh, this person's really good. And like, there's a bit of hero worship, but there is that barrier there where I've never spoken to that person. Like I could be completely off base about, you know, my, this like godly perception of them. And in jujitsu, you know, we can have a brief conversation with somebody and that takes our like fandom to the next level. You know, I'm sure I've been guilty of it a few times, especially when I was, you know, a bit, you know, younger per se in the sport. But um, a lot of people will have that, you know, moment of being starstruck and they latch on to this person and they think this person can do no wrong, Um, especially if that person aligns with what their ideals are, you know, like they become immune to criticism because they were nice to this person at a seminar that this person paid to attend, you know, (laughs) I mean, um, it displayed basic human decency to this person. They acknowledge this person's existence. Um, And I think that contributes a lot to it. I think it contributes more than we really want to acknowledge. Um, Just, yeah, the fact that we can like meet our heroes in Mm -hmm. jujitsu. And also just the fact that jujitsu isn't popular enough for like a whole lot of public scrutiny, you know, like it's, it really is a little (laughs) culty, you know, like people who who aren't in jujitsu. Yeah, they don't really know what jujitsu is unless you're in it. You don't know, like, the biggest names in jujitsu, if they're walking down the street, they're not going to get ambushed by fans. No. Um, and, yeah, nobody really knows who these people are. So you don't see how the, quote-unquote, outside world 
would perceive all these problems within and it's so normalized within the sport that like who else is going to criticize it you well know and I, mean? I think that's part of its draw too I think yeah. a lot of people like the fact like I'm in this outside martial art yeah you don't fucking know it like you don't know what they're doing when they're on the ground but baby let me tell you you yeah. know like that kind <laughs> of thing is my ocean you yeah don't know how to swim. <laughs> and like and like, think about like, oh, I remember like the first time I went to a competition and you're with your team and you're in this hotel and you're like, yeah, we're cool. Like you feel like you're in a fucking gang or something. Yeah. You feel like badasses. You feel like, yeah, nobody better fuck with us, you know, like, yeah. and then y'all get trashed the next day and on the mats. <laughs> You know, you learn, but, you learn. <laughs> yeah, we learn. <laughs> or, oh, I got silver yeah. in my division of two. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Not Which the is all I wanted. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that's part of it. I think jujitsu. So, talking about toxicity in jujitsu, hmm. you know, I think, and actually, I just maybe it's maybe it's my uh, scotch talking here, but insecurity is at the root of a lot of it. Um, yes. I think that a lot of these guys, you know, came up, they were badasses, whatever. I think um, MMA evolved and some of these guys didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think people who join MMA and join jujitsu are people who want one of two things. They want to defend themselves or they want to kick ass. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that everybody gets into jujitsu who wants to kick ass is a bad person. Usually it comes Mm -hmm. from a place of insecurity, you know, like I don't want to get beat up. I don't want to get mugged. If, you know, my girlfriend gets slapped, I don't want to have to be that guy that's like, oh, sorry, dude, (laughs) I'll I'll get her (laughs) out of here for you. You know, like you want to be the dude or, you know, if you're a chick, like I'm a tiny little bitch. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've admittedly always had a little bit of that little man syndrome yep and I'm from Chicago so I've been in situations right and I've always wanted to feel like if someone comes at me I'm gonna fuck you up you know what I mean like I've always wanted to feel like that I would never hurt anybody in fact when I go to competitions I like I get so sick because I can't like I can't stand putting my hands on somebody like literally aggressively that I have yeah. no beef with, you know, like, yep, it fucks me up so bad in the head. I can't handle it. Um, but, but yeah, like it's all insecurity. It's men who are insecure with their positions, which is really where patriarchy is born from. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a bunch of people who sign up because maybe they are the nerds or they are the outcasts and they want to, you know, be badasses and they get this taste of it, you know, this taste of being in a club and, oh, we're badasses, bro. You're a beast, bro. No, you're a beast, bro. Like that kind of yeah. shit. And they get really excited about it. And um, yeah. And I, I think that's why nobody can handle, you know, the criticism. And one step further, I think the coaches, not all coaches, But a lot of these guys are old school. Well, you know what? I guess maybe that's more where I started. I started with some old school, like (laughs) Carlson Gracie, Brazilian dudes. But like, you know, they run these classes. They run these conditioning classes. They run this. And and none of them have any business doing any of that shit. Like, (laughs) they, they don't know how to fucking exercise. They don't know how to diet. They don't know how to eat. All they know how to do is jujitsu. And that's literally fucking it. You know, and Mm -hmm. sometimes like, yeah, sometimes they're good people who know how to do their taxes and like you can fucking (laughs) talk to them like a person. But for the most part, they're a bunch of people who work for, you know, maybe four hours in a day, six hours in a day. And they teach people jujitsu and that's that's what they do. But everybody acts like they have all these other hats and they really don't. And I think they're all kind of afraid. And you know, maybe I'm just, like I said, maybe it's a scotch, maybe I'm extrapolating, but I think at the root of this, they're all a little afraid they're going to be called out like frauds. Yeah. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Cause like, there's one post that I always see circulating on social media that I want to be like, no, um, but it's like, when you sign up to jujitsu, you're not just getting a coach. You're also getting like 
a therapist, a mentor, a dietitian. And I'm like, this person's not qualified <laughs> to do any of those things. Like, stop. Like, you have to go to school for a long time to be a dietitian. Like, you shouldn't be taking advice from somebody who, you know, <laughs> has has Googled a bit of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Your, your coach is not a therapist. Your coach probably needs a therapist desperately. Um, <laughs> you know, like you can't like some of the sounds so mean, but some of the most average people I know are jujitsu coaches. You know what I mean? They have no other. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with what they do for a career. I don't care. You know, I'm not elitist like that, but just like people put these coaches up on a pedestal like they know so much and like all they know is jujitsu and whatever other specialty outside of jujitsu they have and some jujitsu coaches you know they are certified to be personal trainers or you know uh, nutrition coaches whatever you know whatever else they have going for them and that's okay but like in the gym like most people are literally just jujitsu coaches that's all they can Mm -hmm. help you with you know, like high knees, yeah. <laughs> like in, <laughs> shrimp, <laughs> like, <Yep. laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. and, it's, and it's funny because like, I noticed like, a, and a lot of them, when they do these things, they end up blowing a lot of people out. Cause there are all these regular people that sign up and, and they just like, they grind them down. And, um, I knew this one coach, he wasn't my coach, but he was always, you know, really into like harder you know, you got to do it faster. Like, and, and I remember I tell him my friend, I'm like, I was, cause I was watching the videos of this class. I'm like, dude, this is not a good way to get fit. Like yeah. as a fit, like I'm more of it from the fitness and health realm and stuff like that. I'm like, this is fucked up. This is going to be hurting tendons. People are going to blow out their back before they can even bear and bolo. You know, like mm-hmm. yeah. this is not a good conditioning program at all for jujitsu, but where this guy was coming from, like pain was, you know, the thing. Yeah. And it's like, you're just going to fucking wreck all these people by the time they're 30. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they're all going to be has been wannabes, you know, yeah. in forums yeah. like, Oh, you should have fucking done this. I would have done that. <laughs> you know, God, we don't need any more of those people. Right. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. It's, it's just crazy to me. Like it is wild. <laughs> You know, I like to, I like to look people up a little bit. Um, I have been following you for a while, but yeah, I wanted to make sure I, you know, I had my shit together on you before I talked to you, <laughs> but I read this old article from you and it's from 2017, yeah. um, 10 weird ways your life changes after you start jujitsu. I was reading it and I was, I was laughing cause I'm like, holy shit. That was totally me you went through like all this stuff, like, oh, your bruises and your, you know, like weird deformities and you start sizing people up where you're going. And uh, and I'm like, totally. But this one I thought was very telling and I'm going to read it. Yeah. But it's, um, you don't try to be that person whose life revolves around jujitsu, but when you're spending your Friday nights training, instead of hitting up the bar, or can only smile and nod when someone says how much they hate exercising, you start to realize just how much this sport impacts your social life. You're still open to having friends who don't train, but you have a lot more fun when you hang out with the people you're used to rolling around with. And I thought, wow, that's so fucking telling. Everybody that does jujitsu goes to that place. Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to my husband tonight. I'm like, you know, I had the most normal day today. It it was weird. Like I went to my one, my son's parent teacher conference. And then, you know, we're talking to my daughter. I have two daughters and we're talking about stuff. And then we were talking about taking a vacation to the Redwoods. And I'm thinking about all this. And then I'm remembering like when I was in jujitsu, I have to be honest. I don't even know how much I enjoyed family time Mm -hmm. because everything in my life revolved around that schedule. Okay. I lift till 11, then, okay. I go to noon class, but I don't really roll. But then sometimes I did, cause you can't not roll, yeah. you know, <laughs> I'm just going to drill. I'm just going to go to drill during that class, but then yeah. you don't. And then I'd go to evening class at six, you know, and, and you'd have to eat 
to keep up with class. You've had to sleep to keep up with class. You're thinking about, you know, the stuff you have to work on for jujitsu and all this pressure, but you don't realize it's pressure. It's almost like a mania. And for me, I stopped doing art. I stopped writing. Mm -hmm. I stopped hanging out with just normal people. All my social interactions were like, let's let's get the the fights and go to, you know, Rick's house or whatever. Like that was what it was. You know, you start mm-hmm. just hanging out with these people and and it becomes your whole fucking world. I noticed that with like CrossFit and like a few other, you know, culty sports. Let's just yeah. say it. But what do you think about jujitsu causes that level of immersion? That's a great question. And it's something that I've also been really working through over the past couple of years, especially um, as I've made the decision to say, okay, like I'm going to kind of switch my career trajectory. Like I got certified to be a group fitness instructor and a personal trainer, and I'm going to be going into that industry and really scaling back my work with the Jiu Jitsu Times. And at the same time, all this is going on um, while it was rolling. I got injured. Like, I don't know if I strained a rib or sprained a rib, but I haven't been able to train for like over a month. And I've really had to look at myself in the mirror recently and go, who am I without jujitsu? You know, like, who is this person? You know, I can't train. I've been going to like, you know, machines and weights gym, you know, and lifting more and, you know, exploring that part of my fitness journey a bit more. But like, who am I when I'm not at the gym every day to train? You know, I'm still teaching kids class and doing that stuff. But that has been a real mindfuck for me because for the past almost a decade, jujitsu has been my entire life. You know, it has been my career. It's been my hobby. Like even here in Australia, I'd say probably 90% of my friends are from jujitsu, you know, and that's fine. Like I love my friends here. wouldn't trade them for anything, but it is just like a wild realization to come to. And it's been very emotionally challenging for me in ways that I didn't really expect you know, and I think a lot of people are coming to that realization, you know, in terms of, you know, with how the pandemic has affected things, or even as they've begun to take a hard look at the sport and say, do I want to be in jujitsu anymore, knowing that this is how the culture is. I've had a lot of people who have been in jujitsu for a long time saying that to me. Yeah, same, you know, that was a a bit of a tangent, but to answer your question, like, I, I think part of it comes from, part of it definitely comes from the pressure of your teammates. And there's this expectation, I think, that if you love jujitsu, you should also love watching jujitsu. You should also be watching UFC. You should, you know, Bellator, whatever else. You should, like, what are you doing with your life if you're not thinking about, you know, how to get better in jujitsu? You know what I mean? There is so much pressure externally to enjoy all that stuff. And like, I've recently just begun admitting to people, like, I don't enjoy watching jujitsu. I don't enjoy watching MMA. Like, if there's somebody, who I'm emotionally invested in, like if my friend is competing, like absolutely hell yeah. Like I will watch that match or fight all day long, but like I don't have the attention span <laughs> to sit through the amount of jujitsu that my partner does. He's a brown belt. He can watch UFC. He can watch jujitsu all day. And I just can't. And when I tell that to people, they're like, what do you mean? They do not understand it. And when that is so much of your social life, when the the things that people do when they get together and jujitsu is like, oh, we're going to get to together and watch UFC or who's number one, whatever else. And you're just kind of like, eh, I'll go because I like you guys. But like, <laughs> this is not my preferred choice of how to spend a Saturday. There's almost this external pressure to love everything about jujitsu and to make your whole life jujitsu. But I think there's also a lot of internal pressure that people have. Like, I know I've had it where like, if you're not constantly trying to improve, that shows on the mats sometimes. And you always have people that you can compare yourself against. It's not always like, you know, like with writing, you know, I'm always trying to improve my writing, but I'm comparing myself to myself. You know, I'm comparing what I write in 2021, to what I write in 2017. Um, and that to me is less pressure than going to the gym every day and seeing, oh man, that person that I was just beating the shit out of a couple months ago just submitted me. I have to get better. Like, what are they doing that I'm not doing? And it ends up that internal pressure also creates that feeling of, oh man, I need to be watching more technique video. Like I can't be hanging out with my friends who don't train. They're a bad influence on me. You know, like all these kind of weird culty thoughts, I think come from both of those factors, the external and internal. 
Something I started doing even before the pandemic was using a personal shopper for my groceries. And honestly, I'm living in the future now because it has actually changed my life. We used to spend hours on the weekend going to this store, then going to that store because they don't carry the same brands, then going to the pet store. It was sucking up half a Saturday or Sunday, which as most of you know in our capitalistic society is the scant 48 hours we get to do everything in the world we couldn't do during the work week. But is there a fee? Of course there's a fee. No one's picking up your shit and delivering it to your door for free. But hear me out. We've actually saved money since using personal shoppers. You know all that dumb, cute, pickled shit you throw in your cart for no reason? Or, you know, sales designed to make you buy in bulk when you really don't need to? Yeah, you avoid all of that. You can stick to your budget without any temptation. By using Instacart, you can shop from multiple stores in one order. You can give your shopper preferences and substitutions so that you could get exactly what you want and have it delivered directly to your door in as fast as one hour. Instacart highlights deals to help you save money, they give you smart suggestions for new products, and they pick the freshest produce, so no worries about that either. Save time, save money, and save stress. If you use my specific Instacart link in the show notes, you will get $10 off your first order and you'll be supporting this show. So look for my Instacart link below if you're ready to, you know, live in the future. And I wonder if sometimes if it's like the coaches that are just trying to make sure everybody keeps paying their dues, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and buying their yeah. rash cards and showing up and how much of that is, there's a certain type of people that I think are attracted to the sport. And I think a lot of us that are attracted to the sport are the type of people who internalize things, who are always trying to be, become better. Mm -hmm. Um, otherwise, you know, Joe Rogan and optimization would never be like a thing, you know, like everybody wants to uh, get better. I think a lot of us are the type of people who are hard on ourselves. You know, again, they call for women, they call for nerds. And, and I think, you know, the, the nerd in me is debatable, but I'm definitely a woman. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm probably kind of nerdy too, but like, both of those things, you feel like you have to prove yourself even more that you belong here and that you're trying. Some big dude just can kind of flop around and lay on people and just show up and he's the, the guy. But like the moment you slip, and especially as like a small woman, the moment, you know, like we slip, it's like, oh, she fucking sucks. She just got her ass beat again. And, and you start thinking mm-hmm. like, fuck, like. I keep getting my ass beat. What's wrong with me? And there's nothing wrong with you. There's something, I'm not going to say it's wrong because it's not necessarily wrong, but there's something off about going head to head with people every fucking night. Yes. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like playing cards. You're not going to win all the time. There's nights you're going to be tired. There's nights that that person's just going to be on fucking fire. There's nights that just everything isn't going to align for you. And I think sometimes just the the beating that your ego takes, like, oh man, I gotta, I gotta get back to the, you know, the mat. I gotta get back to the books. I gotta study this tape. I gotta, you know, like whatever it's, it becomes this weird obsession, almost like I think dieting for bodybuilders. Yeah. It's like constantly tweaking. Oh, my, my deltoid isn't shredded enough. What do I got to do? You know, like, yeah, it's bizarre, but also going up against somebody else, getting beat up is a shitty feeling. Mm-hmm. And we're the type of people who get beat up every night and just, you know, like, you know, cry in our little box dinner, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> like I said, I, no. I don't know if it comes from the coaches that are just trying to make sure everyone's, you know, paying their monthly fees. Like, oh, you got to keep coming. Otherwise your SIE is going to get warm and it's not going to be good. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> This gym. And, and like you said, everybody's your fucking friend. Everybody is your social circle. It is everything. Right. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's a big part of the problem because as soon as something happens, like you clearly have a, you know, break from your gym story. I have a break from my gym story. Um, you know, 
very close friend of mine has a very painful break from her gym story, you know, and Mm -hmm. when that happens, you lose your whole community. You lose all your friends. Um, because even there, there are some people who are still your like peripheral friends, like, Hey dude, like they still look at your Instagram stories and, you know, give you a emoji every now and then, but like, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that you were cool with that suddenly are arm's length. If you don't go to that gym anymore. And it's like your whole society is done. And I think like people don't respect that enough. It's it is like being in a cult and getting out of that cult, losing everything. And then like the therapy required for people getting out of a cult is like massive. Yes. And people in jujitsu, most people have that story but they've never had therapy for it. Yeah. That's a really good point. That's a you know? really, really good point. And sometimes I think there's some people, you know, like when, when everybody's talking about, uh, you know, race issues and women issues and, you know, and just human rights issues and things like, so half of them, I think are starting to like turn and be like, fuck yeah, this is wrong. Let's change. And I think some people are still so traumatized or so afraid that they could possibly be outed from their gym and their community. Mm -hmm. And that's why they stick in so much and they defend it so much. Cause it's like, I don't understand why any other reason why people don't want this fucking sport to change. That's a really, really fantastic point. Um, And you're exactly right. And when you look at how, how instructors control their students, you know, and they say, oh, you can't train at another gym ever without my permission. It's like, what the fuck? I'm a paying client. Like, you can't tell me I can't go to another coffee shop because I'm buying coffee from your coffee shop. Like, it's ridiculous. But like, when you put it like that and, you know, you, you bring up how that is your social circle and like how much people lose, you know, I know, you know, you've been there, you know, when I got booted from my old gym. I, like I was lucky that there were a couple people who went with me, like when they found out what happened, they left on, you know, voluntarily on their own. But there were a lot of people there that I was like, that person's my friend, that person will, you know, and I, I did not do any shit talking about the gym. There were a few people that I'm like, hey, here's what happened. I'm fine. This is where I'm going to be. Just wanted to let you know that, like, I didn't just peace out with no warning voluntarily, yeah. you know, yeah. but I, I wasn't trying to shit talk anyone I'm like whatever it's their choice um but there were a lot of people who heard that read between the lines and said that's not okay I'm I'm coming with you um there were sorry there were a few people who did that and then there were a lot of people who were like oh that's such a shame like you know I'm really wrestling with my feelings and they stayed you know they're still Mm -hmm. there um and I get it you know like but it's just a bummer you know when that stuff happens and you know, the, the next two gyms I've been at, the one that I went to after that and the one here, um, you know, I've been very open from the start with those gym owners. Like, this is what happened at an old gym. Like, I'm not going to shut up. Um, like, I'm not going to say anything or do anything that would put gym in danger. But like, if you let me train here, like, this is what you get. And they've, you know, both those people are like, totally fine. Like, I am with you in this fight like, don't even worry about it. Um, And that's been reassuring. But I know a lot of other people, that's harder for them, you Mm -hmm. know, or or they aren't somewhere where they have those options, you know, they might be in some rural area or somewhere where jujitsu doesn't have that popularity, and they have nowhere to go. If they get kicked out of their gym, they would have to train in their garage with like, a few other, you know, brand new white belts or something. And that's scary to them. Online Gracie Academy or something. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but it's exactly what you said, like losing that community is is terrifying for a lot of other people, especially when it's that deep in your head and it's your whole life. Like, what do you do if you get booted out? People don't know how to answer that. And that's scary to them. You know, I still have some friends for sure from my first gym, but from the, for the most part, like once you get injured or if something happens in most gyms, you're just suddenly you're gone. I mean, when you come back, everyone's like, oh, hey. You know, yeah, but there's yeah. no, 
there's not much help through your initial months of transitioning back into jujitsu when you're like, oh my yeah. God, I'm, I suck. I can't breathe. You know, this white belt is now a blue belt is now a purple belt and they're whooping my ass and like, oh yeah. my God, what do I do? It's, it's just such a, such a mind fuck. And I think it takes a little bit longer than a few days to jump back. Oh there. yeah. But I think, yeah, once you're out at the gym, I think you're treated as like a nobody. Yeah. That's, that's really fucked up. We've all had to ask these questions this year because there's a lot of gyms that had to close. Like, I think we're finally at the point where everybody's kind of starting to go back a little bit. Either people have Mm -hmm. been vaccinated or people are just done or whatever, but people are training again. People are kind of inching back into the sport. Um, Me, I I personally haven't yet again, because my son isn't vaccinated, but also because you know, just some of the shit you see on social media. Like there's a few gyms that I like that I, you know, I think have a good message and a, you know, good groups and some of them that I was like, Oh, I really like them. And then they like really flamed out during the whole pandemic. And I'm like, what the fuck? I didn't think you were like that. Like what the hell, (laughs) you know? And they went like full conspiracy mode within like you know, the first two weeks, their gym got shut down and suddenly they were like, oh, there's kids in wafer closets. And you're just like, what the, (laughs) get off the internet. God, get him back in the gym. Somebody like, (laughs) like, holy shit, lost their goddamn minds. Uh, But that, yeah. Then I'm thinking like, well, I I don't really know if I can go back to any of this shit. So then I'm thinking like, well, maybe I'll just invite people over to my gym. I have mats in my, my garage gym and we'll Mm -hmm. just go from there. And I don't know, I don't know what I'm going to do, but point I'm roundabouting to is the future of jujitsu and jujitsu gyms. I remember early, way earlier on the, in the pandemic, I actually interviewed Stefan Kesting. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he thought his prediction for the future was we were going to see a split between kind of liberal minded gyms and conservative minded gyms and kind of people were going to start choosing what kind of a space they wanted to belong to. What do you see for the future of jujitsu? I kind of agree with that actually. Um, And something that I've kind of been talking about with, um, you know, my more liberal minded friends is, um, or rather left minded friends is, I I don't think we're ever going to get to the point, unfortunately, where we can do what I would like to do, and just rip the sport up from the roots, start from scratch, you know, get all the bad people out, like, the, the power dynamic is so skewed, I don't ever see the bad getting rooted out to the point where it would change. I think, what will happen and what needs to happen is that other people are going to look at all this and realize like, okay, a lot of people on this side are not what I want from the sport. So I'm going to create my own circle. You know, I'm going to start my own gym. I'm going to have my own rules. I'm going to make this a safe space for people. And so what I, what I think will happen, what I hope will happen is that those circles will get bigger, you know, and maybe, we'll start seeing affiliations who go forward with those values in mind, like at the forefront, not just, you know, as some like fine print policy at the bottom of a waiver that no one ever reads, but saying this is a safe space, we will protect you. Like this is what jujitsu is for us. And seeing those spaces hopefully get a bit bigger, maybe developing into bigger affiliations, something. But hopefully just having more opportunities for people who want to do jiu-jitsu and love what jiu-jitsu is about, love it as a martial art, love it as a sport, love it as a community, but don't want all the, the bullshit that we've been seeing in the past couple of years and beyond. You know, it hasn't just mm-hmm. been the past couple of years. This has been going on forever. So, yeah, that's kind of where I see it going. And I'm not opposed to that. You know, if we can't start from scratch, then the least we can do is kind of if you have two colors of paint, you know, you can hopefully add more paint to one side. To kind of disrupt that ratio a bit and give more opportunities to people who need them. If you build it, they will come. Yes. Or, you know, when I was talking to um, Tori O'Neill. Yes. Uh, we were, her. We, yeah. We were talking about representation and mm-hmm. just, just seeing people in a gym, just seeing women in a gym, just seeing black people in a gym, LBGTQ, you feel like, oh, okay, this is a place I can be. Um, mm-hmm. And sometimes like, really that's all it takes 
you know, because if they're here, that means I can be here. Yeah, you know, exactly. Because I think, I think right now, some of the pandering to women, especially is getting a little nauseating. Um, there are so many predators in this sport. There are stalkers in this sport. Mm-hmm. There are creepy incel type guys in this sport. Sorry, guys, but it's true. And you bring these women into these spaces and promises of self-defense. And all you do is teach them a few high moves and give them a little pink belt. That's mm-hmm. really fucking patronizing. Yes. It's really at its core kind of disrespectful. It's like, what is this about? Is this just a gimmick to get mm-hmm. us in the door? Or is that for more money? Is that so you get more kids in your kid class? Or is that so d- dudes can have their pick? Yeah. What I think a lot of people and what I've seen a lot um, over the past month as this uh, news and these stories have been coming out is um, there's a lot of people who like to put who like to vocalize their support but aren't willing to back it up. I was just like, Ugh, uh, I was feeling pretty down the other day because I'm like, man, I spent a lot of time on the phone when this, when this all first came, came out and people, you know, dim owners and people in the industry were calling me and saying like what do I do about this you know like I I'm really conflicted like I have this problem with the person at my gym like or you know I have a I'm upset about what's happening like what do I do and I spent so much time you know trying to I don't want to say like advise these people but be like look here's the reality of the situation I'm not going to tell you what to do or how to move forward but like here's what it is here's how your actions might be perceived by the community so they gave a lot of lip service to the movement, but they're still buddy buddy with, you know, these terrible people in the sport that they know have done something or have been credibly accused of doing something. And so I think what's important too, when you talk about these programs that are marketed towards women or, you know, any other demographic is like, you can't just put it out there and say, oh, come to our gym. This is good for you. Like you have to do the work to back it the fuck up, you know, like, it's all fine and good to say, you know, oh, we, we protect women here. Like we have a sexual harassment policy, um, which I, I know a few gyms that have a sexual harassment policy and have not followed through with that policy. You, you have to do the work and the work is often really ugly, uncomfortable stuff. It might mean distancing yourself from friends. And it's not just for issues like this. It's also racism, homophobia, transphobia. Like if you want to market to other demographics, you better put in the fucking work to make sure that not only that they feel safe at your gym, but that they are safe. You know, that if an incident does come up, what is the policy for dealing with it? And are you actually going to follow through with it? You know, and a a lot of gyms are just straight up not doing that. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's newer gyms that, that will, that are cropping up now Yeah, that are run by more progressive people. Clearly, you know, people I've never met especially uh, after all this stuff came out, like uh, people were like my inbox is still just hectic, you know, and there's such a feeling of helplessness. I'm sure for them, you know, for anybody they're talking to as well, where it's like, you, you want to help, you want to get this, this person who's accused of this stuff out of the sport and, you know, in jail at best, you know, but yeah. when charges can't be felt. And there's even, I know of a few cases where, like the, the the alleged victims come forward with all this evidence like hard evidence uh, I was just talking to one of them last night um and the the law is like dragging their feet on issuing a warrant like hard hard evidence and like it's oh it's COVID or oh this person's moved so like oh they're not in the state anymore so like oh like what can we do and it's like if somebody goes through all this effort to you know, to, to share their story and, you know, to, to overcome all of the barriers, both emotional and legal that it takes to, to get justice. And that justice still isn't happening. And that person is not only not arrested, but still in the jujitsu community, you know, because it's not like jujitsu is like basketball or soccer, where it's like a, it's a sport, you know, there's a ball and you pass it around. Like you are learning to get better at violence, you know, and that whole argument of like, oh, well, smaller person can beat a bigger person. Like, it's true. Like, I'm a brown belt. Like, I I know that if somebody came in and fought me only in grappling, like, I could probably beat them up, you know. But 
if somebody comes in and they are at the same experience level as me, even if they have a few years of jujitsu and they're significantly larger and stronger than me because they're allowed to keep training. So they have the technique and they have the size and strength advantage. Like I'm fucked, you know, especially if they're starting to throw punches or, you know, whatever other expertise and violence they have. So that's why it's extra important. I think like people are like, Oh, well, this person served their time or, Oh, there's no, you know, there hasn't been any, um, yeah, they haven't been convicted yet. Like that's cool for the law, you know, for, for the court of justice, like absolutely fair. But as a private business owner, what are you doing when there are credible accusations against somebody for like abusing their knowledge of violence and their position of power? And you're letting them into that gym, putting them in very close contact with other people who could be victims eventually. And letting them get better at violence like what are you doing it is not like you can refuse service to anybody you can say i'd you know obviously like discrimination blah 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 but like you can say hey sorry man like this is an accusation it's credible like you have to find somewhere else to train and people are just too scared to do that and it's dangerous it's beyond upsetting it's dangerous and it makes me wonder where all this tough shit is Oh, yeah. Like, what? I thought you were a tough guy. I thought you were running around slapping people and, you know. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not calling him out. Like, I don't really give a shit what he does. But, like, yeah, <laughs> th- there's all this, you know, machismo and, like, walking around with, like, the invisible lat syndrome at the <laughs> world. It's like, yeah, this is yeah. our crew. And then this shit happens and they're all, like, they don't want to deal with it. And some of these guys that, you know, like, are abusers – they're not even that tough. Like if Mm -hmm. I was a dude, I could beat them up. Like, so please somebody fucking help us because like I've said before, the problem with us women, if we want to beat a man in combat, we have to get violent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's, let's not fuck around. We're not doing IBJJF. If somebody jumps us to rape us. Yeah. We're eye gouging, we're tearing your face off, I'm ripping your throat out, I'm stabbing you if I have a knife. We can't just stand and bang with a dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I mean, some of them maybe, but for the most part, you don't know. No, I, I choose violence because they have an advantage. You know, most yeah. men are, you know, 30 to 70 pounds heavier than I am. Yeah. It's just, it's fucking mass. It, it's physics, right? So like, yeah we have to make that choice. So when it's our teammate or our coach or our quote friend Mm -hmm. that's doing this, we can't just fend them off with a fun little game of jujitsu or a little guy wrestling in the grass. Like we have to kill you. Yeah. We have to maim you if we're going to win. And that kind of moral dilemma inside of ourselves I think is what shuts us down a lot oh yeah you know I've been in I was in a situation I was actually on my way to a jiu-jitsu camp once um this was in Costa Rica and I was sitting on the bus um and this is also just hearkening back to a point that I bring up a lot is that for as much as we talk about women's self-defense and jiu-jitsu like a lot of people do tend to frame it as oh it's the person who's going to attack you is going to be the random person jumping out at you on a running trail or bike trail statistically that's not the case it's somebody it's an acquaintance it's a friend you know and like who are the people we train with in jujitsu yeah acquaintances or friends or coaches people that we're close to um but there's a lot of there's a lack of mental preparation i think that's given to women like uh, what happens if like this does happen to you like how do you bring yourself to reality um so this is the story that i was going to tell was that i was on a bus on my way to a jiu-jitsu camp in costa rica and um there was this guy um when i went up to get my ticket in line the woman was like okay like um here's your ticket and the guy behind me was the guy who's going to be sitting next to me she's she's like okay like haha this is your like your seat buddy like you're gonna be sitting next to each other like all right and for some reason I just had a really negative gut feeling about this guy did not know why like looking back you know it's not like oh like there were all these obvious signs like no obvious signs he did not so much as look at me beyond like the whole like oh seat buddy haha okay like went off and did his own thing was on the phone with his girlfriend wife 
you know, somebody with a, you know, term of endearment that he was using at some point on the phone. Um, so no signs that he was a bad dude. I was just, I had this gut feeling, but I ignored it. And I get on the bus and I fall asleep um, some, you know, three hours in and I wake up and this guy's elbow is like digging into my boob, which is like a thing that happens a lot. Like if you're sitting next to somebody, like that's how you often get like groped. Um, and so I'm like, hmm, that's weird. Like, I'm like, oh, it's close quarters. You know, like sometimes like that physical contact can't be avoided. It can't, yeah, it can't be avoided. So I lost my arms and like, you know, blocked his access and I fell back asleep. Next time I woke up, I was wearing shorts. His hand was on my thigh, just like on the side, not fully on. And I'm like, weird, but again, close, close quarters. Like maybe he's asleep too. You know, like maybe his hand just did that, but. I stayed awake and like slowly his hand started sliding up my thigh and tried to get under my shorts. And I'm like, ah, and again, I was a blue belt in jujitsu at the time. Like I wasn't an expert in jujitsu by any means, but like I could have wrist locked him, you know, could have done something. And like, I'd been training, you know, for a few years at that point, I was like, like looking back again, like I, I'm like, would I have done anything differently now? Probably I'm older. I'm smarter. I take less shit from people. But at the time, all I did was I picked up his hand, I like squeezed his fingers together and I just like threw it off me. I didn't raise a fuss. Like I, I just kind of like sat there, you know, like I didn't say anything. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? It was just no, you know, without actually saying the word no. And that really stuck with me because I'm like, for all the training I did, I was training six days a week at that point, often twice a day. And like for all that training I did, when I was actually confronted with the situation, where like that violence might have been warranted, or at least that I thought I would be empowered enough to be like, what the fuck? Hey, everybody, this guy's trying to grope me in my sleep. And I just said nothing. And I continued to sit next to him for the rest of the trip, you know? And I think that's something, and I've heard that from other women, not in that exact situation, obviously, but that when it came time where, you know, the, their training would have been justified, they froze. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not something that's talked a lot about in jujitsu as well. Because women are so conditioned yeah. to not put up a fuss. Yes. We are so different from men. Men can walk in a room and just blah, blah, blah. Like they are, you know, so entitled. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys, but you are. <laughs> you take up space. You just walk in a room. You sit down. You fart freely. Like you do all this <laughs> stuff. And I, I mean, like we left, but like, yeah. fucking, we can't do that. No, exactly. It would be like horrifying. And it's funny because like, I wasn't raised like that. Like my yeah. mom um, had some sexual, you know, trauma in her past. She was, I was like, Liz, you know, anybody ever fucking touches you, you this, <laughs> this and that. And, you know, and you, and she was a fighter. Like, I mean, she wasn't like a real fighter but yeah. she uses a little spitfire that didn't take any shit and she'll yell and scream and all that kind of stuff so she raised me to not take any shit but yeah. something happened in society where like you said where these dudes do things and you are so afraid to say anything like what if I'm wrong what if he's yep. actually a good guy like you said what if he's just digging in my tits because he's asleep yeah. I don't know you know like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever yeah. you you fucking justify all this shit so yep. when I see like these women that go through these hoops and jump through this shit like that is real because 90% yeah. of us and even you know badasses like us we don't say anything yep we don't cause a ripple we don't want to you know, appear unhinged or be that bitch that fucks everything yep. up or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I guess we all have probably a little bit of a reckoning to, to understand where the fuck that comes from. When I was in sixth grade, twice during my sixth grade year, men tried to abduct me off the street. Oh my God. It's my little, it's my weird, it's my weird story. Like fun oh. facts that, about me. Yeah. But here's the thing. Both of those times I did discover I could pull the pin, right? Mm -hmm. So 
the first time, you know, I ran up to somebody's house, I banged on their door. And, and the second time this dude tried to grab me, he was on a bike and I was walking home and he grabbed my arm. And I'm like, don't touch me. You know, like I did the whole uh-huh. thing. And the crazy thing is, is there was some old woman outside and she was, I don't even know how old she was. I was in sixth grade. So she was probably like 50 and I'm like, oh, she was ancient, but you know, she, yeah. she wasn't that old, but she was pruning her little bushes outside. And she looked and she saw me shake his arm off and be like, don't touch me. I don't know you. And she just looked back at her bushes. And my reaction was like, you fucking cunt. Are you kidding me? Like, yeah. But then again, was she just doing what we did? Yeah. Like, oh God, don't say anything. Like. What if I'm interrupting, or, you know, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or what if anything, or I don't know, and maybe not, or what if I get hurt and I don't know, you know, like we just freeze up, but she didn't help me. And I thought, oh my God. And this guy kind of rode up on his bike ahead, like a block ahead, but he kept looking back at me and I had big shears in mm-hmm. my school bag, like big sewing shears kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, I took them out and I walked all the way home with those things in my hand and I was ready. You're so I was fucking ready. Cool. Sorry. Like, like that's horribly <laughs> traumatic. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But if it wasn't for that, because there's, there's been other scenes, you know, there's been other situations yeah. where I've totally froze and I've let things happen or done, you know, done things I wasn't, you know, fucking proud of. Like I wasn't a badass. Um, but mm-hmm. oh yeah, I do know. And as I've grown up, I've gotten to some altercations when I was older with, you know, weirdos on the street and I like, boom, but not all the time because I'm afraid. Yeah. Because here's the thing is when you pull that pin, like you commit. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like yeah. if I go violent, this is an IBJJF. Yeah. I have to understand that I could be stabbing this guy in his fucking throat in a second. And yeah. am, I, am I ready for that? Yeah. And yeah. every badass is going to be like, yeah, totally, man. Yeah, dude, I'm tactical. Yeah. I've got a knife in my pocket. <laughs> I got the, you know, like, are you really ready for that? Yeah. And most of us women go, no, 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 not yet. Everything's going to be fine. I don't have to do this yet. Yeah. And then they're in a situation and then they're fucked. I agree. It, you know, it's funny too. Not funny, haha, but just like strange is a lot of the times all it really takes is somebody else noticing and saying one little thing and those guys go running. There was one, I was in a store once, like the supermarket and this random like middle-aged dude came up to me and um, he was like, hey how's it going I was like hey not bad and um he kept talking to me and he's like uh oh I'm I'm a painter by the way and I'm like oh cool and he's like yeah like I I do a lot of like you know I paint models and things like that I'm like that's cool and he's like you know I would love to paint you someday like (laughs) there it is like oh Jesus (laughs) Christ um and uh he he was very like insistent like I would I have a studio at my house like I would love for you to come and I was like 2021 20, at the time like I was young and still naive um but obviously like that was some shady shit you know but I didn't have the the guts at that point to be like that's weird like don't speak to me again you know I was just kind of like haha that's cool but no thanks you know and like I kept trying to deflect and there was this older woman like elderly not <laughs> you know not like 40s like elderly who just passed by and she looked at him like she said hello sir and he was like Oh, hello like he got really nervous and she's like how are you today it was just this look mm-hmm. he's like oh yeah yeah okay and she's like and she was just watching him you know yeah. and that's all it took and suddenly he had somewhere else he needed to be and walked right away from me like that's all it takes sometimes is somebody else you know letting that person know like eyes on you buddy you know and yeah. I wonder you know like that woman who you know turned the other way and looked back at her bushes with you like what would have happened if she had just said something like, Hey, honey, come over here. You know, like something that that guy knew that if, you know, he took you away or something happened, there would be one witness, you know, and that's all it would take. A lot of these guys are are soft, (laughs) you know, like they're, they're cowards at their core. That's why they target weaker people. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They're, they're not going to target the black belt. They're going to be like, yeah. And and they're not going to target, you know, the loud mouth Karen. (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're gonna yeah. take the, the quiet girl that's probably already been traumatized or the the kids who yeah think that oh this is this is the guy that teaches my class I'm he wants to give me a ride home what a yeah. nice guy it's so yeah. common but like God, it never it never gets easier to hear about that stuff to round this out let's how do yeah. you how do you cope with suddenly having to hear all these stories and feeling all the weight of everybody's 
confessions? Yeah, it it's hard. Um, there was a time when we were in the thick of all this, like there was probably a solid week where I was, you know, running on three hours of sleep and, you know, my partner would walk into the lounge room and I would just be sobbing, you know, and that sucks, but it's the... I don't want to say the reward because it's not a reward, but the impact of, of those stories, you know, of knowing that these people are getting their stories heard, that hopefully some people in the community are waking up, um, that really makes it worth it. I know that sounds a little like, I don't know, like a little hokey or cheesy, but like, it's, it's true. You know, like it, it's hard emotional work. It's, it's harder for me when it's like, Hey, I'm so sorry, but like, I, I can't tell the story right now. Like there, there's not enough evidence. I don't want you to get in trouble. I don't want this guy coming after you, you know, and also protecting myself as well. Like I have to be very careful with what I put out there as well. Um, and to me, that's much harder yeah. knowing that there are stories and knowing that the people telling those stories are probably telling the truth, you know, and they want their story out there and knowing that this might be the only way it gets out to a wider audience and knowing that I still can't help them like that to me, like that keeps me up at night. Um, yeah. And that's very frustrating, but uh, the actual weight of everything else, like this is the first time in my career where I've had such a large number of people behind me um, because I've tried to tell these stories before and I had a few people behind me, but it, it, there was more pushback than support and this is the first time, and a lot of this is thanks to Mo. Um, like the community owes him a great, great debt. Um, and I, I say this a lot just to myself, but I'm like, all we needed was one person with power in the community to speak up and to give a shit. And like, look what's happened, you know? Um, and he's been, you know, very, I want to say flattering. He's been very kind and thoughtful to me and saying, you know, oh, like all the stuff I've done wouldn't be possible without you, it's like referring to me. But I'm like, the stuff that I've done has been like, none of this would have been possible without him either, you know? And so having his support, having the support of so many other people um, and knowing how much it's helped, you know, the, the people who are affected by this has really, it's been cathartic in a lot of ways and it's helped alleviate any stress because there's been a lot of stress but it's helped alleviate a lot of that yeah I can imagine it's been cathartic for a lot of us mm -hmm. um like reading these articles like and a lot of us have been going through the comment sections mm -hmm. and for every jujitsu dude that comes out and says fuck this shit mm -hmm. you feel like yeah they do have our back they do yeah. give a shit because the guys that are running around being little shitheads are becoming a smaller and smaller group. Yes. You know what I mean? Like the guys in the comment section who will say things like, you know, some girls like r having a train run on them. Yeah. You know, um, I'm not going to name names, but yeah pepperidge farm remembers yeah <laughs> <laughs> i know who this dude is yeah. um when somebody says shit like that and then i look at my jujitsu community oh they still follow him yeah oh this guy talks a big fucking game about being pro women but mm, he follows the guy who thinks that uh women like having trains run on them yeah and yeah. who do all they can to defend rapists and pedophiles in comment sections when they mm -hmm. could just, I don't know, shut the fuck up and not yeah. say anything, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so in a way, like part of me is glad, like, oh, okay, I know who you are now, bud. I'm never yeah. going to one of your seminars. I'm never, yeah. you know, I'm not dealing with that shit. But like sometimes it hurts when you see people and you see your friends that are still following those people because they have to still kiss ass. Fuck that. And then you see the guys that are like, no, this isn't cool. Mm -hmm. Or guys that start hammering them, you know, and then you're like, wow, yeah. that guy's a badass. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, one thing I will say um, regarding like social media interactions, I pay a lot more attention to who's liking posts because mm -hmm. like I know there's some people that I follow. I know it's like my job, but there are some people that I follow, not because like I like them or because I support them, but because I want to know what's being said, mm -hmm. you know, or like, I want to know, like if they do something stupid, I want to know about it, you know? And I know that's not the case for everybody, but 
I would always be very, like when I see people liking these guys' photos, I'm like, I gave you the benefit of the doubt with the follow. But like when you're showing support, that's where I'm like, nah. like yep, you fucked up. Um, <laughs> yep. <sighs> yeah. So that drives me um, a little bit crazy, you know, and it, one thing that really disappointed me um, when this all blew up is the number of people who are like, oh, I, I don't feel like I should have to say anything about this, but like, I don't condone sexual assault. Like you did the bare minimum. Congratulations. And you did it reluctantly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I understand that it's not some people, like not everyone wants to talk about this all the time, but this was the best opportunity in recent memory, certainly in my recent memory, you know, of being, you know, being involved in jujitsu that people have had their moment, the mic to say like, I do not condone this. I don't, not only do I not condone sexual assault, I don't condone the enablers, you know, like I, there was such an opportunity to speak up and so many people who could get away with, you know, saying this is not acceptable. These layers of complicity are not acceptable. Um, And they just chose to not say anything you know, or they chose Mm -hmm. to make some super weak statement or they chose to make a weak statement weeks later. And I'm just like, you had the perfect opportunity. And so that brings up the question for other people, not just for me, but for everybody else, like, why are you so reluctant, bro? Like, why do you want to stay quiet when this is the perfect opportunity to say something worthwhile? You know, so People say, oh, people just should assume that about me. But, like, you can't assume that about people. Certainly not in this, you know, clusterfuck of a sport. You know, you can't assume that somebody is against sexual assault when when they're not speaking up about it. You know, when they're not putting forth the bare minimum effort from the get-go. When when the conversation is ripe to make a statement like that. Like, I I, I keep an eye on a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, I do, (laughs) too. Um. From usually I, I have another account. I have yeah. like a private, like nobody follows me on that. Like it's just a lockdown account that I kind of go yes. through. I go through the shit I don't want to see. Like you, yeah. you said, you know, yeah. um, and for my, for my community it goes more into the, also into the gym, into the lifting, into the, yeah. you know, and all that. And like the manosphere. Yeah. <sighs> but some of them I don't follow, but I have a hate stock list. So yeah, I go, I, yeah. I'll click on their stuff, but I don't want to give them a follow because yeah. I don't want to, you know, boost their signal. I don't want to give them yep. any algorithm points, um, but I got to look at what they're saying. Because if I don't yep. know what they're saying, I don't want to be blindsided. Yeah. Like, oh, what is this crazy thing happening right now? Because if, if you don't follow some of these people, yeah, you don't, you don't know what's yeah. about to happen. You know, yeah, or what's, yeah. you can't put two and two together, but yeah, you're right. You know, so many people, it's like, who the fuck can't say, Hey guys, raping a 16 year old girl is bad. Yeah. Like, yeah. Apparently a lot of people yeah. <laughs> find a hard time saying that. And, and you're right. Why? Why? Yeah. Did you rape a 16 year old girl? Did your buddy rape a 16 year old girl? Are yep. you in, you know, like in a gym where, you know, some guys probably raped a 16 year old girl. Yeah. And, and, and you're too much of a fucking puss to say anything about it. Big yeah. Bad, big, bad alpha wolf male. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, know it's kind of funny was um, when all this stuff started coming out, I was, um, I was sharing just for like information's sake, you know, who was speaking up. Like if I saw somebody with the platform and they said anything good or bad, like I shared it so that people could be like, okay, hmm. this person says something. You know, I didn't see anything from this person. This person said something pretty fucked up. Like just so that they were aware who was saying what, you know, in the first few days. Um, and as I was putting these things up, like I would put someone's, you know, post up and I would get a few messages from other people saying, ah, this person says this, but they're accused of this, you know? And it, w- it was like, you know, the pointing Spider-Man meme where like everybody was like, this person's accused of this, this person did this, this person did this. Like they were all accusing each other. And I'm like, I, I wanted to just like, you know, you can't do this. I wanted to screenshot all this and like just put it on blast and be like, do you see now, like when we say that this is systemic, 
do you see what we're talking about? Like it's everywhere. Like it's everywhere. The people who are saying this stuff are also the people who are accused of doing this stuff. Like there's, it was like, I was laughing to myself a little bit, obviously like it's horrible that this is, I'm like, it's everywhere. It's fucking everywhere. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is. It is. Uh, Yeah. What do you do? (laughs) I guess you do what you're doing. Uh, You do your job. Yeah. Right. Wild. Well, I I can't thank you enough for doing it because I think, you know, fuck it. It's time. Time's Mm. up. But it is time's (laughs) up on time's up on all this shit. Right. Yeah. You know, we've all been living in this weird box for so long, um, depending on our, our on our rung on the social, you know, ladder. Yeah. You know, and like you said, it has so many intersections too. Yeah. Like depending on where you are, like, okay, if it's about, you know, men, then the white woman is below this person. And if it's about white people, okay, then the white woman is above these men. And, you know, like it's, yeah, it's the most fucked up shit. And at, I think all of our core, we all know what's going on and we all act fucking surprised. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, Uh, like it's, it's a strange thing. And I I don't know, maybe people just have a hard time coming to grips. Maybe we're all just like in this super intensive therapy session right now. (laughs) And like, yeah, I hope that people will come out of it better. I think we've got a little more time to go though. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) But hopefully this is the start. I get a lot of questions about podcasting since I started my show. And the easiest one to answer is my hosting site. I use Buzzsprout because they have clear cut and well-priced tiers. They're so easy and user-friendly. Plus they have cool features like making promotional sound bites that you could post to social media. They have downloadable audio players you can put on your website and stats that break down who's listening and where they're coming from. If you're confused as to how to get your show on platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, and all the other podcast apps out there, don't even worry. Buzzsprout does that for you. And they send you monthly updates on your podcast and tips to make it grow. I totally recommend checking them out. If you use my specific link in the show notes to sign up for a paid plan, you will get a $20 Amazon gift card and you'd also be supporting Damn Well Better. Win-win. So look for the Buzzsprout link below and sign up if you're ready to start broadcasting. Hey guys, if you like what I'm laying down on this podcast, please give it a like, a comment, subscribe, review, or share me with your friends and let me slide into everybody's ear holes. I'm on the web at www.ironbeaverfitness.com. I'm on Instagram at Iron Beaver Fitness. I'm also on Facebook and I post podcasts on YouTube. If you want to be a part of the Rebel Club and support, please buy my Rebel's Guides available on Amazon or stop by my merch store, cop some cool shit, and feel free to pick an item off my Amazon wish list. All purchases allow me to keep doing what I do for you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time.